Andreas is the global leader in trade credit insurance and a recognized specialist in the areas of bonding, guarantees, and collections. With more than 100 years of experience, the company offers business-to-business -business client service, uh, financial services to support cash and trade receivables management. It's, it's proprietary intelligence networking tra uh, tracks and analysis of daily changes in the corporate so uh, solvency among small, medium, and multinational companies active in markets representing 92% of global GDP. Okay, and the company also represents over 50 countries and is a company of alliance. So without further ado, let us start with the webinar on the impact of global economy and mitigating your cash flow risk. So now let us first welcome our first speaker for today, Ms. Fanshio Huang, Senior Economist APEC of Euler MS, who will share with us more about the impact of COVID-19 on global trade and economies in 2020-21. to 21. So over to you, Fanshio. Thank you, Tiffany. So let me just uh, share a screen for uh, the presentation I'm going to give. So um, the world is still um, dealing with this COVID-19 epidemic. Uh, and actually, we've seen the most of the shock uh, in Q1 and, and Q2 of this year. And economies are now, countries are now uh, looking at plans to uh, leave lockdowns and to deconfine their economies. In this presentation, uh, we, will still, we will first look at the impact uh, the COVID-19 epidemic had on uh, the global economy, how much, how deep the trough, uh, and is the trough, how, how deep is the trough, and is it behind us? Secondly, as economies and authorities now are looking into restarting uh, activity, we will look at how this is happening and uh, we will track the uh, progress of this uh, re reopening. Uh, and thirdly, I will uh, uh, focus, I will, I will move on uh, from the global uh, presentation to a focus on the Asia Pacific region uh, with uh, some, uh, with uh, in particular China, uh, Singapore and the ASEAN countries. So first of all, the COVID-19 epidemic has uh, put an unprecedented shock on the global economy. Uh, we have been looking at some high frequency indicators, uh, so on a monthly and daily basis, that shows, for example, that in some uh, of the largest economies across the world, uh, during a lockdown, during confinement, domestic activity is below, uh, is 30% below normal levels. We have seen also in March car sales that fell by more than 50% year on year in Europe and nearly 40% uh, in, the, in the United States. The shock is particularly strong on, on consumption uh, as people and households are uh, barely allowed to, to leave uh, their homes. And we see that business confidence in particular in the services sector uh, has been affected with the purchasing managing indicators uh, in the largest economies, the US, China, and the Eurozone, reaching record, record low levels uh, in February for China and in April for uh, the, uh, the US and, and, the, and the Eurozone. Uh, in the face of this unprecedented shock, uh, authorities across the world have stepped up the policy response to try and manage this crisis. In the initial response, central banks have uh, increased a lot the liquidity injections for, uh, for, the, for the banking system. You can see uh, on the chart on the left that in particular the Fed has uh, drastically uh, increased the size of its balance sheet, uh, which is now 50% uh, of, of, uh, of GDP. And on the fiscal side, the response also has been uh, very strong in a name uh, to try and mitigate uh, the impact of the, uh, the economic impact of the COVID-19 uh, epidemic on, on companies and on households. So here actually this chart on the right doesn't uh, take into account the latest announcements we've had in, in Japan and the fiscal, uh, the size of the fiscal support is now actually nearing at, uh, around 20% of, of GDP for, for, for Japan. Um, these fiscal measures take the form of infrastructure spending, uh, tax delays or, or, or cuts, some boosts for consumers, uh, some easier financing, some state guarantees for, for, for SMEs. On the next slide, uh, we look at, for example, the breakdown of how 
the policy measures uh, are distributed, what kind of policy measures, policy supports are put in place for, for SMEs. So here it's only a breakdown. We don't look at the total size of the, of the support. I will go into a, a bit more detail for uh, the Asian economies, uh, how the size of the, of the fiscal supports uh, for companies and households uh, compare uh, across uh, countries. Um, so all in all, uh, having seen how big of a shock uh, the COVID-19 epidemic um, is, ha has uh, put on the global economy, uh, for 2020, uh, we forecast global GDP to contract by 3.3%. Uh, this is uh, revised down actually compared to what we had as, uh, as late as March because we're taking into account uh, a larger um, extent of confinement and lockdowns both in length and both in terms of uh, geographical areas because more countries over the past month have announced or extended uh, lockdown measures. And at the peak, actually, we had uh, around half of the global population and half of global GDP that was uh, under, under lockdown. A 3.3% contraction of global GDP, what does that mean? Uh, that means that actually around $9 trillion uh, of uh, GDP will be lost this year. Uh, this is close to the combined GDP of, of uh, Germany and, and Japan. Um, in terms of quarterly profile, you can see on the chart on the left that the uh, heat will be mostly felt in the first and second quarter uh, of this year. In the first quarter, uh, that's when actually the COVID-19 cri uh, crisis began, uh, starting in China. So it's mostly uh, the heat we're seeing in, in the first quarter of 2020 is mostly uh, through the heat on the Chinese economy. Uh, and the second quarter is when actually uh, we had uh, more economies, more countries uh, going under lockdown uh, with the shock of the COVID-19 uh, morphing from a trade and financial shock to a more domestic driven shock with uh, private consumption and households uh, being uh, obliged to stay at home in uh, almost uh, in, in uh, many more uh, economies. Uh, so what does this contraction mean for global trade? Um, we forecast, uh, obviously, a, a contraction in, in, in trade as well. Bear in mind that uh, 2019 was already not very good because we had this uh, US-China trade tensions, uh, trade war context, which meant that trade was already contracting in, a, in, a, in value terms. But the contraction this year is expected to be much larger. In the volume terms, uh, we have a 15% year-on-year contraction in global trade. And in value terms, uh, given the, the sharp drop in commodity prices and simultaneously uh, the, the strengthening of the US dollar, uh, we have a, a decline of 20% year-on-year in value terms uh, in, in global trade. In dollar terms, that's uh, trade losses will a total $3.5 trillion. Obviously, these numbers could uh, change again. Uh, news uh, as, as late as uh, the last weekend show that there might be additional uh, threats to, to the developments of global trade going forward, as uh, there are simmering tensions again between the, the United States and China. Also, this context, uh, this, epi this epidemic may be uh, pushing some economies, some authorities, uh, towards more industrial autonomy and towards uh, reshoring some of the, the supply chains that are currently very globalized. Uh, we will actually publish a more detailed uh, note uh, later this week on, on, on global trade. Uh, but at this stage, at least, uh, we already see a very sharp contraction in, uh, in global trade. What this context means for insolvencies uh, is that we forecast a 20% increase uh, in, in 2020. Uh, that's, uh, that number also has been revised up actually from uh, what we had in, in, in March. In Mar March, we had a 15% increase in insolvencies at the global level. So this 20% increase uh, now that we have breaks down into 50% increase in insolvencies in China, near, near 20%, nearly 20% in Europe and 25% in the United States. So there might be some questions uh, about why we don't have an even uh, higher uh, forecast for uh, insolvencies. 
Um, actually, uh, our forecast takes into account the historical sensitivity between insolvencies and the economic cycle. And we also try to try to, to take into account government interventions that try to mitigate uh, the negative impacts of this crisis on corporates that I have uh, mentioned uh, earlier in this uh, presentation. Uh, which means that, which, which is why uh, in 2020, we have only, let's say, a 20% increase, but that is not to say uh, that across countries, uh, there might be some uh, differences with some countries seeing higher insolvencies if the government intervention is not as efficient than in, in other countries. In sector terms, uh, this is, these are the sector rating downgrades that we have uh, done in the first quarter of this year. And that's an update we do on a quarterly basis. So in Q1 2020, if I look at the Asia Pacific region, uh, we downgraded uh, nearly uh, 30 uh, sectors. And actually, uh, we also have the Q1 insolvencies numbers by, by sectors. And uh, Mabel, in the, in the next presentation, will go into more details on, on that topic. Having looked at the shock, uh, the, the broad numbers of how bad the uh, epidemic uh, will be for uh, the global economy, uh, now we want to look at how uh, countries and economies across the world are going to exit this crisis. So first of all, uh, the question is about how to restart uh, activity, how to restart business activity after confinement and lockdown measures have basically put uh, countries on pause for several weeks uh, and even uh, more than two months in, in, some, in some countries. Uh, to the framework of our thinking uh, on this question is to look at mainly two factors. On the one hand, so that's the horizontal axis on the chart you can see on the right, is the health readiness uh, for a country, for an economy to deconfine. So here uh, we look at uh, the epidemic data. Uh, for example, we have uh, built an in-house effective reproduction rate. Uh, so it looks at on average how many people one COVID-19 infected person will contaminate. We also take into account the testing data and we take into account whether if a winter season is coming up in a, in a, in a given country. Uh, and that uh, gives us an idea uh, about, just based on the sanitary situation, based on the development, the evolution of the epidemic, is the country ready uh, for its society, for its economy to gradually come back to, come back to normal. So that's the first factor. And the second factor is the economic vulnerability to confinement. That's the vertical axis of our, of our, of our chart on the, on the right. And here, what we look at is that is um, how much uh, an economy will be hit by confinement measures. Uh, we take into account, for example, the economic cycle. So was the economy already in a good position going into uh, this, this crisis? We look at uh, whether if uh, there, is, there are a lot of employment protection measures that can that can help uh, people which are who are who are without a job because of, of, of this crisis. We look at the contribution to, to uh, of tourism to employment because understandably in the in the current situation uh, the tourism and travel uh, sectors are one of the uh, most hit as people are are not uh, moving anymore. And the idea is behind this factor is that even that um, authorities need to make a trade-off and need to find the right balance in the trade-off between uh, managing the health situation, uh, controlling the number of new COVID-19 cases uh, developing, and on the other hand, uh, what the confinement measures mean uh, for the economy and what the economic cost of a lockdown, uh, of a longer lo lockdown uh, implies. Uh, that's why actually some economies. Uh, I'm thinking about a few uh, in the of the yellow uh, of the orange uh, points. Uh, the group of countries we have uh, named the most vulnerable ones actually. So some of these economies uh, are not ready just on a epidemic data perspective to deconfine yet, but there might be they might be considering it already. So for example, in the Philippines. Uh, it, it, there's nothing official yet, but there are media reports that uh, maybe the president will not uh, extend the lockdowns uh, currently uh, in place uh, beyond uh, mid-May. Uh, 
Uh, in Indonesia, there are only partial lockdowns, even though the, the, the epidemic situation is not um, comforting uh, yet. Uh, so these countries, given the high economic cost of confinement, may be, uh, may be thinking of uh, deconfining uh, earlier than, uh, than uh, what the sanitary crisis uh, dictates. And so the more you move on the right, the more you can find countries uh, that uh, have um, managed uh, to control the, the epidemic uh, situation. So that's the our framework of, of thinking uh, for, for uh, how a country uh, can uh, deconfine and how an economy can exit the, the lockdown. Uh, looking beyond uh, the phase we are now, so actually right now uh, we're between the first and the second stage. Uh, the first stage being uh, economies being under lockdown and as, uh, as uh, social distancing and confinement measures aim to flatten the curve of, uh, of the epidemic evolution. In the second stage, we have these gradual reopening of, of uh, economies, uh, depending on the country we're around that stage right now. And what we see is that in the third stage, uh, the, the global economy will be gradually getting back on track. And in a potential fourth stage that obviously we cannot uh, exactly forecast, but treatment, an efficient treatment may, might be found against the epidemic, allowing the global economy to, to fully come back to normal. So I, as you can see actually in the latest developments on, for example, financial markets, there has been substantial excitement about this potential path of uh, the global economy coming back to normal as more and more countries are thinking about or considering uh, the de uh, deconfinement plan. Uh, however, uh, we would uh, caution that these deconfinement plans are likely to be very gradual. And as a rule of, th uh, of thumb, actually, at the global level, uh, we uh, assume that most economies will be functioning at only 70 to 80 percent of their potential for a few quarters. Uh, so even though societies and economies seem to be uh, coming back on track, it's, go it's going to be a very long and gradual process before, um, before economies uh, actually uh, come back to, 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 to full potential. And looking at China in particular, um, because uh, China was the first country uh, hit by the epidemic, uh, it was the first to put in place lockdown, confinement measures, travel restrictions, and it is also the first to, to it was also the first to to to, to think about uh, coming back to normal. Um, we can see that even now, uh, based on the high frequency indicators we look at, even now activity is probably still around 15% the usual levels. So on this slide, uh, we look at uh, three high frequency indicators. On the left, it's uh, basically the coal energy consumption. Uh, in the middle, it's traffic, con traffic congestion. And on the right, it's property uh, transactions. So the levels, uh, we compare uh, week after week uh, from the, the Lunar New Year, uh, how 2020 compares to a similar week uh, in, the, in, the, in the past few years. You can clearly see here that across all indicators, uh, all three indicators we look at, uh, the activity level is still uh, below uh, the, what we had seen in the, in the previous years. And in particular, you can see a big gap for a property transaction. What we take from here is that uh, the demand side of the economy, the consumer side of the economy is taking even longer to, to come back to normal. So the supply side, the, the manufacturing side, the construction side is, um, so to say, more, uh, can be more easily managed by authorities. But it's more difficult for governments and authorities to uh, force consumers to go back uh, and, and spend uh, because consumer confidence has been uh, clearly badly hit by, by this sanitary crisis. And there might be some delay in spending and even some precautionary uh, savings. And uh, that's what you can see in China through the property transaction volume, proper, uh, properties being obviously the biggest uh, consumption item uh, that a household can, can, can uh, spend on. And uh, property projections are still 60% uh, below their, their normal levels. 
Um, so when we say actually that uh, the Chinese economy could come back to a more, no, more, more normal level of activity uh, by the end of June, uh, we're thinking more about the supply side, uh, the, the, construct, the manufacturing side, the construction side, but on the consumption side, it could take longer uh, for confidence and, and household behaviors to, to come back to normal. Uh, overall, for China, uh, what we see is uh, growth going down to 1.8% uh, over 2020. Um, that comes after 6.1% we had in, in 2019. Uh, we do see a rebound in 2021 with GDP growth uh, reaching eight, uh, about 8.5%. Eight but over the course of 2020, um, Q1 and Q2, so the first half of, uh, of 2020, are likely to be badly hit. As you can see on the left, we have penciled in uh, negative year on year growth. Actually, Q1 was already released um, uh, two weeks ago and came in at uh, nearly minus 7%. And we have another uh, negative uh, growth uh, forecast for, for the second quarter of this year before a recovery uh, materializes as the rest of the world uh, come back, gradually come back to normal. And as uh, just mentioned, uh, the domestic economy also in China uh, come back to normal. Uh, this uh, recovery is uh, held by, by policy support. Uh, both on the on the fiscal and the, on the monetary side. Uh, on the fiscal side, we expect uh, measures, supportive measures, to account for six and a half percent of GDP in total in 2020. So that's uh, relatively large for China uh, compared to previous years. But it's not, as you have seen uh, in the in a, in a previous chart, and, and we will see uh, for other Asian countries, it's not particularly large. Uh, compared to, to other countries. The stimulus will uh, make mainly consist in public investment, in infrastructure, uh, health projects, green policies, technology, and also corporate, corporate tax and, and, and corporate fees uh, cuts. Uh, on the monetary side, uh, the central bank has in, injected nearly 3% of, uh, of GDP worth of uh, liquidity with a particular focus uh, for SMEs. Um, the cost of credit uh, interest rates have also been uh, brought down. Uh, however, uh, our assessment is that the, the monetary stance is still relatively cautious uh, and the, the SMEs actually and, and private sector are not uh, fully reaping the benefits of these uh, monetary benefits because of risks in the, in the, in the banking sector system and because banks uh, may be still prudent in the way they allocate uh, credit. Moving on to the region uh, as a whole, so we forecast a uh, minus 0.6% decline uh, in 2020. This means that the COVID-19 uh, shock on the region will be larger than what, than what uh, the region had experienced between, uh, during the Asian financial crisis. Back in, back in 1998, growth had, uh, was at uh, plus 0.1%. Uh, you can see uh, on, on this slide that uh, we expect all of the main economies of the region to experience at least a technical recession uh, in, in, in 2020 uh, because confinement measures are being announced or extended uh, in the local economy and also in uh, its trading partners. Economies that are seeing uh, a more important, a more significant outbreak of COVID-19 uh, epidemic and economies that are more dependent on global trade and tourism are likely to be the ones hit the hardest. So that includes Hong Kong, Singapore, uh, Thailand, Malaysia, and, uh, and Japan. Going into 2021, uh, we expect, uh, in reflection actually, uh, also uh, with the global economy, and what we have just seen on, on China, we expect a recovery in Asia Pacific with GDP growth uh, improving to plus six and a half percent. So uh, you might wonder why this is uh, above the potential uh, in terms of growth rates. Uh, well, there's a mechanical reason just because 2020 we're coming off a very low base. Uh, the growth rate uh, in 2021 is uh, just easier 
uh, easily uh, going to, to, to higher levels. But also um, economies should be feeling uh, the impact of supportive uh, policy mix as, as, both, as both a monetary and, and fiscal measures to put in place to, to help navigate and recover uh, from, from the crisis. Uh, looking more precisely at, uh, at Singapore, so in 2020, we, we expect growth to incline to minus 4.1%. That means that the shock actually is stronger than what we had seen uh, during the, the Asian financial crisis, uh, when in 1998, growth had declined to uh, minus 2.2%. Uh, Singapore actually, uh, well, uh, similar to, to, to other economies, but it's uh, definitely relevant for, for Singapore, is under the double whammy of uh, both domestic and uh, external demand being, being under very uh, strong pressure. Uh, domestically, uh, uh, as uh, I'm not uh, teaching you anything here, uh, the circuit breaker uh, is obviously uh, uh, putting a big hit on, on, on private consumption. And, uh, and externally, um, confinement measures and lockdowns in uh, Singapore's trading partners are, are, are putting a, a, big, uh, a big hit on uh, external demand for, for the Singaporean uh, economy. So we have supply chain uh, disruption, external demand disruptions uh, at play, travel restrictions uh, also uh, impacting uh, tourism, and uh, of course the sudden decline in consumer demand that is that is uh, created by the by the circuit breaker. Um, some other economies to look at. Uh, so in Indonesia, for example, we we still have at the moment a slightly positive GDP growth uh, forecast for for 2020. Um, there are downside risks to to this number. Um, one of the downside risks uh, is that actually Indonesia is the economy that is most dependent on external financing uh, in, the, in the region. Um, and as uh, the currency depreciates and as foreign, as foreign investors pull out uh, their capital, that could create uh, financing uh, issues for, for, the, for companies in the, in the, in the country. And, uh, and if this situation deteriorates, uh, we, we could uh, be considering uh, to, to bring down uh, the, the forecast again for, for um, 2020. Um, of course, there's, there are also partial lockdowns in place. If these are extended uh, in duration or in, or in uh, areas, uh, the GDP growth for, for, for 2020 will also be brought down as domestic demand is, is uh, hit further. Uh, the fact that China is coming back to normal bodes well for, for Indonesia, but uh, bear in mind that other uh, areas of the, of the global economy are still uh, very, very gradually only coming out of the crisis. So uh, the, econo the Indonesian economy will not uh, benefit from any boost uh, from external demand in, in, the, in the short term. Uh, in Malaysia, we have uh, penciled minus 3.2% GDP growth. Uh, that's also the lowest since the Asian financial crisis. Uh, bear in mind that Malaysia is also an economy that is dependent on external uh, financing requirements. So uh, there might be also some downside risk uh, for, for, for a number of minus 3.2% in, in, in 2020. In the Philippines, uh, we have a slightly less uh, large contraction uh, at minus 2.6% in 2020. Um, so the Philippine economy is, uh, is an economy that is, is the economy that is most dependent actually on private consumption in, in the region. So all depends actually on how long uh, the confinement measures and the lockdowns uh, are put in place in some of the, the islands of the, of the, of the country. At the moment, as mentioned earlier, there are rumors that they might be lifted uh, by uh, mid-March. Uh, so that's the next. Uh, if that happens, uh, the risks, I think, are relatively balanced on the, on the forecast we have uh, at the moment. Uh, in Thailand, uh, we have, uh, we, Thailand is one of the countries uh, that is most hit by the epidemic, uh, given its uh, high exposure uh, to tourism. Uh, in, in terms of employment, actually, around uh, 15 to 20 percent of, of local employment is uh, driven by the tourism and, and travel sector. 
And unfortunately, uh, the recovery and tourism and travel um, is probably going to take even longer uh, than other areas of, of uh, consumer spending. Um, so that's why we have put, uh, put uh, uh, um, one of the larger uh, downwards revisions uh, for, the, for the Thailand economy and risks uh, maybe even the still skewed uh, on the downside. Um, and for all, uh, all, all these economies and, um, and the region, uh, as you can see, uh, we do have a rebound factored in in 2021, the rebound being more or less strong, depending on the local um, uh, conditions and the government supports. You can see uh, uh, a summary of these uh, government supports uh, on, on this slide. So um, there is particularly across Asian economies, there is more room for, for, for fiscal uh, support. And all uh, the major economies uh, in the region have put in place very strong uh, support. On the chart on the right, you can see in terms of point of GDP, how big uh, the support amount to. Uh, actually here, Malaysia should be stronger uh, because uh, our presentation as of April doesn't account for the latest measures. Uh, but the support is in Malaysia is also nearing 20% of GDP uh, right now. And uh, the fiscal measures, um, it depends across the economies, but uh, some are putting in place cash transfers, uh, tax referrals, uh, tax cuts, uh, wage subsidies, um, and there's some support, also special supports to, to SMEs. Also on the monetary side, uh, uh, some economies, some, some central banks are uh, incentivizing uh, banks to uh, lend more and uh, to more preferable conditions to, to SMEs. And uh, interest rates are being cut uh, across the board in, in, uh, in many economies. Uh, so overall, for our, our, our forecast, our, our outlook for the global economy and for the region is that um, we, 2020 will be uh, more or less a, a lost year. Uh, we, in terms of quarterly profile, we may be around the trough, but bear in mind that the recovery will be very slow and maybe uneven uh, across sectors and, and economies. And as uh, the policy support morphs in from um, uh, crisis mitigation into a recovery uh, support, uh, in 2021, we should see uh, the global economy uh, rebounding more, more visibly and, uh, and GDP recovering more, more visibly. I'll uh, give the, bike, the mic back to Tiffany now. Okay, thank you, Francis. Okay, so next up we have Miss Mabel Lowe, Senior Business Development Manager of Euler RMS. She'll be talking about how the increase of delayed and non-payments will affect your business and what you can do to protect your cash flow and exports against this default. So Mabel, please, can I have you? Hello, everyone. Um, good afternoon. Hope everyone is staying safe and healthy at home. I'm Mabel here, the BDM for Euler Hermes Singapore. Happy to be in this webinar to advocate trade credit insurance, a very common tool these days um, in helping SMEs today's, today to actually protect their cash flow and export against payment defaults and insolvencies around the world. This slide actually shows our Q1 2020 report. It shows a decline in major insolvencies compared to the record reached in Q4 2019. This decline led to a lower level both in the number of cases and in terms of severity. So you can actually um, focus on the Asia-Pacific sector, which I've drawn out here. We have a total of uh, 20 number of insolvencies for Q1 2020. So you may realize that this is actually due to the decreases in Asia-Pacific. I would also like to highlight on APEC where the total number of insolvencies reached 20 cases for Q1 2020 versus in Q4 2019, where it has fallen by 12 cases. So in APEC, the sector that has the most number of hits will be in construction with four cases, followed by every food and retail. Generally, globally, 2020 started with a very high number of cases in the construction sector and in the retail sector. North America posted another quarterly increase in major insolvencies due mainly to the energy sector and retail sector as well. Western Europe 
has remained a key contributor to the global count of major insolvencies, with 25 cases despite a slight decline, and uneven trends by sectors, in particular, increasing cases in the construction, metals, and machinery equipment sectors. As you all might know, the lockdowns across the world are disastrous for the oil sector. A very familiar name, which you guys might have heard of, Hinlong Trading, the oil trader founded by one of Singapore's richest men has filed for bankruptcy protection as it seeks to restructure debts of almost $4 billion. Faced by financing issues, this has caused a spectacular collapse in oil prices and slump in fuel demand caused by coronavirus. Hence, banks are continuously and cautiously reducing the exposure here. So this slide actually shows a tough dilemma for exporters. A global market research company, Ipsos, has done a survey with APEC exporters. And this shows us a dilemma within a few situations here with exporters. Half of my buyers have requested for more credit. This shows actually the various reasons why exporters are selling on credit. 91% of exporters offer open accounts upon buyer's request. Whereas 82% of exporters do so to increase trade sales. And 74% of exporters do so to boost customer loyalty. Cases have been seen in an edible oil manufacturer here in Singapore. Looking at revenue estimated about 15 million revenue in 2018, they have mentioned that we have many overseas customers asking for credit terms. However, we are conservative and do not extend credit to the unknown overseas buyers. So these customers have actually gone to competitors who are able to extend credit terms. We are losing out on sales. Another actual situation with a food distributor in Singapore has also claimed the revenue, um, revenue of this um, distributor ranges about 55 million in 2019. They have also claimed that their customers are asking for higher credit limits as they are expecting increase in sales. So they are actually very supportive of their customers to want to help them to sell more. But lately, they do see the payments being dragged. Now let's take a look and focus on uh, Singapore downgraded sectors for Q1 2020. There are actually a few downgraded sectors um, other than retail, chemicals, transport, and automotive sectors have also been impacted. Automotive manufacturers and automotive suppliers as well. But today we'll focus on two of the downgraded sectors in Singapore. Retail sales, retail trade sectors impacted by sharp decline in tourist arrivals, as well as a fall in domestic consumption due to the COVID-19 outbreak. Retail sales are estimated to remain in red to August 2020, as retailers will continue to face pressure, as safe distancing measures are implemented to reduce the risk of community spread of COVID-19. A, a way on domestic consumption with adverse impact on retail trade and food services. With the outbreak becoming more widespread, Singapore has tightened its borders control significantly since February to reduce the import of COVID-19 cases. Brick and mortar retailers face challenges in the retail sector, grappling with e-commerce and rising rental pressure. E-commerce players are facing late delivery issues or cancelled orders during, to, during COVID-19 outbreak. This is very evidently seen, especially in Singapore as well. Their supply chain and logistics are also heavily disrupted from overseas supplier. Next, let us look at chemical sector. Global supply chains have been affected by lockdowns imposed by governments in their attempt to stem the pandemic. According to data at end of Q1 2020, risk analysis reports with Euler Hermes, results have shown that 
factory activity in Singapore has plunged more than 20% in February from the previous month. Chemical output has decreased year on year in January 20, with all segments recording a decline. The hardest hit will be the petrochemicals. Overall to date, the output for chemicals cluster has decreased compared to the same period in 2019. Now let's take a look at agri-food sector here in global context, a sector which has not been let off in terms of insolvencies across, even in APEC. Year on year, from 2015 to 2019, record, in 2019, the combined revenue of major insolvencies in agri-food is the highest in North America, followed by Asia Pacific. Companies now are facing new Five new challenges. These include a change in eating habits, firstly, especially in the West with consumers seeking out healthier foods. Trade disputes that are facing companies to diversify food channels. An upside pressure on wages, as well as the inability of food processors to pass higher input costs on to customers due to a lack of pricing power. There also has been changes to the profit rates of agri-food industry as a whole. We expect further deterioration in the operating margin of the whole agri-food industry. Now let's look at the payment trends, stretch terms of payment across various sectors have all been experienced. Warning signs of a tough year observed even before COVID-19 outbreak. Overdue amount of up across all sectors that we have observed and underwrite in Eula Hermes. Disruption due to COVID-19 will start to reflect in coming months as May 2020 invoices become due. We also see a very significant spike in claims, mainly driven by hard commodities, construction and electronic sector due to, due to the impact of COVID-19. And we forecast a rise in global insolvencies up to 20% for 2020. These defaults will increase on the back of this development. How then do you actually protect your receivables? How then do you grow safely in challenging times like this? Now I would like to take you through and have a look at a typical balance sheet structure of a corporate. You can see that assets like land and buildings, machinery and equipment, inventories, etc., they are all insured. However, accounts receivables, which hold more than 40% of an average company's total assets, remain uninsured. This is the only major asset that has been left uninsured. And according to Eula Hermes in-house study source in 2019, European businesses have written off more than European dollars, 350 billion, constituting to more than 3% of global trade transactions due to late payment or even non-payment. Now let's look at the basics basis of trade credit insurance. Trade credit insurance protects your SME's main, SME's main assets like trade receivables against unexpected bad debt losses due to insolvency or slow payment. We insure all your receivables that is on credit sales, which means all your recurring invoices that you issue to your buyers. Our multi-purpose solution here is customized to SME size, sector, and business requirements, enabling them to grow safely while reducing the probability of default. Let's take a look at a product basis. Your company sells its product by providing trade credit to your customers. You need to have some form of knowledge to pick and keep the right set of customers. Of course, the more you want to sell, the more credit limit you will have to grant to your customers. 
and then your customers will have to pay their debts at their due date. Their ability to pay you will be outside your control and is always depending on many factors. Your company's ability to pay your own suppliers, your operating expenses, and your employees' salaries, etc., will also therefore depend on your ability to collect payment back from your customers, where if these debtors do not pay you, your operation and capital runs at risk. Eula Hermes can equip you with the right intelligence and provide coverage and risk monitoring for default and even slow payments in order to let you make informed decisions to pick and sell to the right customers, which is very critical. According to statistics, every third insolvency is a result of another company's insolvency. This is my favorite slide. Now let's focus on the three main points where this tool, this risk management tool, can actually help to add value to your business. Firstly, in the form of protection, free credits secure your existing receivables against non-payment and insolvency. Trade credit, protect your cash flow and balance sheet in the earlier example, which I've given in the earlier slide. Secondly, we help you to grow and expand to new markets. We give you the confidence to offer credit facility to new buyers since day one. Foreign buyers whom you do not know well, you don't know them well, or you're unsure, please pass them to us and we will assess them. We will let you know on our risk appetite for coverage. We approve the limits and then you sell. We give you the confidence and knowledge on new buyers in the markets that you want to expand to. We also help you to increase your credit limits to existing customers. The last point which I would like to touch on will be in terms of financing. It can be very difficult for small and medium business SMEs to get traditional bank loans from risk adverse financial institutions. However, SMEs do use factoring to obtain financing under which a business sells its invoices to financial institutions at a discount for immediate cash. This is one of the best ways to improve your business immediate cash flow problem. Trade Credit Insurance, TCI, helps you to obtain better bank financing terms with double A rating with Euler Hermes, as we are the only credit insurer with double A rating. Now let's focus on the ROI of this product. Based on total sales of 5 million turnover, the total amount of credit limits that you will need to grant will be around 850,000, assuming that the terms of payment that you give to your buyers on your invoice is 60 days. It means that the limit exposure can revolve around six times per annum. This in turn will bring you 850,000 times six times, which in turn brings you to about 5 million sales turnover. At the below section, you will see additional 50K, 50,000 uh, SGD additional limit that you're requesting for. So any, uh, any 50,000 additional limit that we have granted will contribute to additional 300,000 of sales revenue. Well, let's now assume that your sales margin is 5%. Consequently, the margin that you have made on the additional sales will be 15,000. The premium rate charged to be applied is about 0.2% of your whole sales turnover. This 5 million that we are insuring in total, which brings to premium amount payable of only $10,000 sing. Your new sales margin of 15,000 based on just additional 50,000 limit exposure granted to your new or existing customers has already outweighed your capital outlay, which is the premium payable for a whole turnover coverage of $5 million. 
This is how amazing this product is. Always time for good news at the last slide. The Singapore government has come together with Enterprise Singapore to help SMEs to encourage and facilitate trade safely, especially in times like this. Government is subsidizing 50% of the minimum premium kept at a lifetime support limit of 100,000. A qualifying company only needs to fulfill the three criteria below. Let's look at the, the eligibility criteria. Business entity needs to be registered and physically present in Singapore. Secondly, you only need to have a minimum of 30% local shareholding by Singaporean citizens or Singaporean PRs. Lastly, maximum group of employment of 200 employees or total group revenue not exceeding 100 million. Simple, isn't it? You can speak to Yulu Hermes for further consultation. You can also, um, this will be my contact. My name is Mabel here again, my email address, my contact number, and do visit our website for free buyer checks as well. Thank you. Okay, Kensha. Thank you, Mabel. Thank you so much for you know, the presentation. So now let us move on to the Q&A session. We don't really have much time, but we'll answer a couple of questions from any of the uh, participants um, that have some of the dying questions to ask. So for those participants, if you have any uh, questions to ask, please feel free to click on the Q&A button below to type in your questions. But because of the limited time, uh, please bear with us if we are not able to answer any of your questions. For those who did not answer anonymously, meaning if you have leave your contact, your details there by not answering, uh, the, uh, by not posting the question in anonymous, um, you know, we will actually forward all your questions to Euler Hermes to answer all the questions that you have, you know, um, after the whole event. But of course, for those who have, you know, very personal questions that you'd like to email Euler Hermes, you can just email to Mabel emails, um, you know, contact details there directly. So uh, last but not least, I'd like to inform you there will be presentation deck given. After the whole event, we'll be actually sending you this link via email and you can actually just click on the link, fill in some of the information and then you'll be able to download the pre uh, presentation deck after the event. Okay, so now let us welcome back two speakers to answer some of the Q&A questions that, you know, some of our participants have with us, okay? And, okay, so first up, you know, after, you know, listening to all the different kind of uh, analyses, you know, maybe the first question that I do have from some of the participants is more on Singapore economy, uh, which is more on, you know, a question to friends yours, you know, uh, given that Singapore economy is highly dependent on external factors, do you think that we have already come to the full impact of the economic downturn at the current moment or, you know, more to is expected? And on top of that, do you think we are looking forward to a U-shape, V-shape, Nike shape, or even a W-shape, you know, for Singapore economy in the next couple of months? Yeah, thank you. Um, I think the worst of the heat for the Singapore for economy is not completely over yet, even though we may be nearing the end of the of the of the bad sequence. Uh, because uh, first of all, even domestically, the circuit breaker is not uh, is not uh, lifted yet, and externally, um, some of uh, Singapore's trading partners are only just about maybe considering uh, deconfining and reopening their economies. But in any case, they are definitely not yet uh, back to full uh, normal uh, levels of uh, activity. And even in our framework of thinking, we had these steps, you know, with first the economy reopening domestically, and only afterwards can we consider maybe uh, the global trade uh, framework and, and the global trade uh, network uh, coming back towards normal. And given that, as you mentioned, uh, the Singapore economy is so uh, dependent on external trade, this means that uh, the, the heat on, on, the, on the economy is, is not over yet. Another factor to, to take into account, again, it's not in our central scenario at the moment, uh, but if we do have these trade tensions uh, materializing, these threats that were just um, announced by, by the United States over the weekend, 
against China, if these are actually materialized, uh, Singapore will again be caught in the middle of this uh, trade war as uh, it had been in, in, in 2019. And in terms of what shape of recovery, um, uh, we are still banking on a U-shaped uh, recovery, uh, even though the trough and the length of the bottom part of the U um, is actually longer than, for example, what we had expected uh, in, uh, in uh, about a month ago. Uh, on our downside scenario is that we see an L shape where we have kind of a protracted, protracted crisis of the global economy. Uh, and there would be several triggers for that. For example, the epidemic uh, lasting longer than, than expected, uh, policy mistakes with not enough support or wrongly directed support, um, any credit events, financial sector uh, crisis events, that would push us uh, into an L-shaped uh, outlook. But at the moment, in, in the in taking our current assumptions based on the current situation, uh, we are still banking on that U-shaped with uh, two quarters long uh, bottom part of the, of the, of the U. Okay, thank you, Francis. You know, I hope that the economy do recover, you know, as soon as possible. But I think moving forward, we do have quite a few uh, risks to take note, um, you know, in the coming months ahead. So, okay, next up, I will move quickly on. Uh, okay, next question, I think it's more for Mabel. Mabel, I do have someone, uh, Pat. Pat would like to ask about, you know, Euler Hermes Trade Credit Insurance. How competitive is the product compared to bank accounts receivable financing, particularly at the current pandemic where government has initiated, you know, seri a series of financial assistance to SMEs? I think main thing like what we have mentioned that, you know, this trade credit invoicing is quite new to a lot of the SMEs. So, you know, working capital financing to SMEs is definitely not a, uh, not an unknown thing. So maybe you can talk a bit more about the differences and maybe in what scenario SME should consider using more of the trade invoicing versus, you know, uh, just going to the banks and getting some receivables or financing loans from them. Yep. Okay, sure. Um, yeah, I see the question here. How competitive is uh, trade credit insurance compared to bank accounts receivable financing? I would like to highlight that these are both two different products. So um, how I have, uh, what I have mentioned earlier on how trade credit insurance can aid in financing is uh, in terms of, let's say, let's look at, uh, the, for example, in the steps of a uh, factoring case. The first step is actually to approach uh, the banks or the factoring house, uh, obtain a factoring credit facility. And then the financial institution will take into consideration the SMEs, which is the borrower's financial strength as well as uh, their invoices, their buyers, their trade receivables, their aging report, and other factors related to the business. So upon satisfaction of due diligence, a credit facility, which we call it a factoring facility, will be granted by the financial institution. So how you will step in is, um, uh, the for example, the factor actually takes on the risk of the invoices that remain unpaid. And then uh, you will actually comes in at the last part to package, we actually the, the back end credit insurer to, to give banks the comfort to disperse the funds. Yeah. Okay, so uh, I hope that answers uh, Jane Ong and Pat uh, with regards to the differences of factorings and the banks, um, you know, the differences with Willow Miss products. Okay, and talking about that, okay, uh, on the products itself. I do have, okay, uh, Narin. Narin is also asking, like, what's the minimum turnover for the TCI products? You know, um, so what's your take on it for Mabel? Sorry, the minimum? Um, turnover for the TCI product. I think what she's trying to mean is, like, you know, if let's say, uh, is there a minimum for, you know, the insurance ins to insure the products itself? Yeah. Um, ideally, we look at um, at least... I would say about minimum three million, because actually there will be a minimum premium that needs to be applied onto the trade credit insurance. A uh, minimum premium amount of um, at least euro ten thousand dollars. So in order to um, make the 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 product more worth it, I would say the 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 minimum turnover that we're looking out is there about like I think three to five million. 
But of course, yeah. um, any turnover below 3 million, we can still look at it. It's just that the minimum premium still apply. So um, our, we apply our, minimum, our premium rate based on many factors, based on the turnover, based on um, the different customers and buyers. We assess these buyers based on their country, their sector, their financials, and uh, probability of default. And so-called like assess it based on a, a very blended uh, performance portfolio of this product as a whole in order to um, package even more factors um, yeah, and variables to, to calculate the, the pricing tool. So turnover definitely is, is uh, one of the, the considerations of uh, our premium calculation as well. Okay, I, I believe for every company itself, they probably have to approach you guys directly to assess each and every um, you know, individual invoicing, whether you guys will be able to insure at the end of the day. All right. So, okay. And talking about that, okay, still back to you, Mabel. Okay, I do have, um, you know, um, Mr. Uh, sorry, is Chong Yen. Uh, Chu Chong Yen would like to ask this question on, is it possible for the TCRS to apply only to selected customers instead of the entire portfolio? Um, I do have a lot of times, especially during this COVID-19 period, certain industry has become more vulnerable than the rest. So, you know, is there any other, like, you know, things that you're, you guys look out for? And on top of that, I would also like to add on, is that what kind of paperwork or like you guys are looking for and how fast you will process this whole invoice, uh, you know, in, to ensure this whole invoice, everything. What's the processing sure. time like? Hmm. Okay, sure. Uh, probably I'll just take on the, the processing time first. Um, it's very easy. Um, depends. Uh, we actually, the very first step is um, we, will, we will need uh, to collect some bias information like the buyer's companies, addresses, um, credit limit set internally within a company that you would like to grant, um, currency of, of the invoicing, um, and also um, some information on the, the turnover port that we're looking at. Once we assess the customers within about maybe five to seven working days, depending if it's a domestic market, I think we will be able to release the credit assessment results within one week's time. If it's export uh, customers like Indonesia, Thailand, where it's um, not so accessible to, to um, collect the financials, to purchase the credit information report, it might take about two to three weeks time to assess the, the whole uh, portfolio. So let's say if we are looking at just purely domestic alone, um, after assessing paperwork, is, uh, we just need to fill out the proposal form, make sure that we have the full aging report to, to ensure um, that we have clear and full visibility on um, the customers uh, who are overdue or who have not paid up. Yep. And uh, bad debts, declaration, the last uh, three years loss history information is also very critical in order for us to assess the, the premium rate and all. Yep. Uh, all in all, maybe about two to three uh, working weeks will be the fastest that we can execute it. And uh, I'll take on the, the, the first part of the question where Ms. Chu has asked, is it possible for the TCIS to apply only to selected customers instead of the entire portfolio? Um, yes, ideally we'd like to ensure all your buyers on open account to ensure a more balanced uh, portfolio like what I've mentioned earlier. We do not encourage um, our customers to cherry pick. Uh, we want your, your very good customers your best, most excellent ones. We want your not so sure about them customers and we want your really weak buyers as well included so that um, the good buyers can actually carry the, the weaker ones ahead to achieve a more optimal overall risk grading as well as a more blended premium rate will apply to the whole turnover portfolio. Um, what is not covered will be things like cash transactions intercompany sales, um, disputed invoices even, and um, overdues that has um, occurred past the uh, maximum extension period when we start the policy. Yes, um, so we ideally want to ensure all your credit sales. 
Okay, thanks Mabel. I, I hope that, you know, answer a holistic questions with some of the questions for being posted. Due to the limited number of time, probably I'll take the last question that I think many of the SMEs, um, you know, more or less you guys have USDs, USD, you know, rates with you guys. So, um, someone asked, okay, I think this is for friends yours. Uh, last question is, what's your view on USD to SGD in general for the upcoming, you know, market trend? Will USD continue to strengthen itself? Or, you know, uh, it will start to weaken a bit. Yeah, French yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so the, the margin for movement for the, given that the central bank, the, the math in, in Singapore targets the, the, the currency and the recent movements to um, adjust the band uh, for, for the currency, uh, well, it was adjusted so that the appreciation stops. Uh, in the short term, there might be a, a, a bit more uh, room uh, for the for the as the Singapore dollar to depreciate in, against the U.S. dollar. Then, uh, in a more medium term, uh, in maybe uh, by the end of the year or, or in 2021, uh, there could be some appreciation again as the global economy recovers and and the Singapore economy recovers and, and generally speaking, as uh, on financial markets, uh, risk appetite come, comes back, that would mean that the US dollar would be, uh, could depreciate uh, a, little, a little, allowing the Singapore dollar to recover. Okay, Ken Shia, thanks Francios. Uh, I hope that answers many of the SMEs who are holding on to USD or do have import and exports in USD dollar. Okay, we've come to the end of the presentation. So sorry, uh, we do know that there's still quite a number of Q&A questions, but rest and sure, after this whole event, we'll be actually, um, you know, generating the report out so that you Miss will be able to reply back your questions via email itself. So without, without further much uh, delays, you know, we'd like to thank Mabel and Francios from ULMS for today's webinar presentations. And you know, thank you so much for preparing all the presentation deck and providing so much information for the SMEs, you know, and the participants uh, that attended our session for today. Mm -hmm.